This is Duke University. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Fuqua Faculty Conversation. On behalf of Fuqua, I want to welcome alumni and others who are joining us today. I'm Kathy Clark. I'm an adjunct professor here at Fuqua. I'm part of the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, which we call CASE, and I run our Impact Investing Initiative, which we call CASE I3. Um, so we're going to um, have a fun talk today. Um, in terms of what you can do to participate, thanks for joining us. Um, if you'd like to submit a question for the next for the conversation that we're going to have over the next 45 to 60 minutes, um, you can send them by email. Um, some, have already, some people have already submitted questions, and that's great, and we've reviewed those prior to the session. You can also submit questions by tweeting them during this session to the hashtag Fuqua Alumni. Um, we're going to try to address as many questions as I can um, during the next 45 minutes, um, and I really look forward to interacting. Um, with you. And if I do answer your question and you want to follow up, you can use Twitter to do that too. And I, I will see that and, and be able to respond so that we can have a little bit more back and forth. I wanted to start today by recapping a bit of the subject that I covered in the pre-reading video um, that, we, that we posted a few weeks ago. That video is still accessible on the site if you want to watch it afterwards. In it, I talked about the evolving field of impact investing. I talked a little bit about the size of the field. Um, there's some recent research showing that the public part of the market is about six billion. The private part of the market is uh, about 49, uh, six trillion, excuse me, six trillion in the public markets and 49 billion in the private markets. Both of those are assets that people are using to invest with, with two objectives. They are trying to make some sort of financial return and they are also trying to have some sort of specific social or environmental impact with those dollars. And that's kind of the overall definition of impact investment. I also talked a little bit about how the field is evolving. Um, it's a field that in some ways has been around for a long time, um, and I'll talk a little, little later about um, kind of some of the evolving terminology and definitions around socially responsible investing versus impact investing, but people have been doing this for a while. What's new is that more players are coming in, players from philanthropists to corporates to um, high net worth individuals to banks and financial institutions, and there's a trend that's being driven um, by millennials, by young people, and also by baby boomers. Um, and that's been really interesting. I talked a little bit also about um, some research that we've done here at Fuqua uh, and with our partners and a book that uh, I and my co-authors recently produced called The Impact Investor um, that uh, looked really closely at the question of performance. So along with Ben Thornley and Jed Emerson, um, we really wanted to look in, in depth to say, what does it take to meet both these both, both these objectives when you're investing? And what can we learn from, from people who've been successful? And we look specifically at funds, at the vehicle for that. Um, and as we were looking through the field and, and you know, studying the development of this field, we see there aren't any real benchmarks um, or indices to allow people to tell whether their investments are kind of doing as well as they should or, or not. Um, so you know, we went in depth and um, uh, looked across a whole bunch of different um, uh, funds and you know, tried to pull out what the lessons are for successful impact investing. Um, I ended the talk with some teasers um, about how everyday people can get involved in impact investing, and I also started to talk a little bit about the emergence of corporate forms that are going along with the interest in impact investing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I talked a little bit about B corporations um, and this idea of creating either a certification or a corporate form that would actually encapsulate the mission and tension of a for-profit company and protect it um, so that the, the entrepreneurs who have started that company can make sure that the mission and the things that they intend to accomplish um, can, be, can be captured in there. Um, and I think I talked a little bit, or I might talk today a little bit about how that idea of locking up a mission within a company is something that has been actually taken by um, the global community in a series of conversations that happened over the last year by the G8. So, um, you know, this notion of, you know, how do we actually build a set of companies and a set of funds and a set of vehicles um, that can actually have impact with their dollars, it turns out we need to change some of the infrastructure of the field to make that happen, and that's starting to happen too, which is really exciting. Um, what I want to add today is just how um, 
how exciting I think this field is. And, you know, part of that is because there's so many people um, kind of rolling up their sleeves and helping to build it. It's not set in stone. And so as you'll see, as I go through some of your questions, there's a lot of things I can't answer. I can talk about some of the progress that's been made, um, but we're, we're still kind of building the railroad um, as we travel along it. And it makes it a really exciting um, time to be involved in this field. It's an exciting time for our students and our alumni. I also wanted to mention that last, I guess two weeks ago, um, I attended the Skull World Forum, uh, which is a gathering that's happened for the last decade for social entrepreneurs all around the world. We held a private meeting there that was sponsored by Barclays, which was looking at um, what are some of the obstacles to the field of impact investing growing. Um, and we specifically were looking at where would we need to segment this field slightly differently. And we chose three obstacles and looked at them from a segmentation perspective. We looked at kind of what is the on-ramp for new investors, and there's some questions that people have already submitted about that, so I wanted to mention it, kind of what are they seeing when they first get engaged, and what is their experience in understanding this, and how do we simplify it for them and give them the right, the right path in. We also looked at the issue of data. A lot of your questions today, which I was thrilled to see, were really about how do you even define impact? How do you track it? How do you share it? Can it be standardized? Um, and we talked about that in great detail um, a few weeks ago, because it turns out it's really complicated complicated um, for different parts of the field, and I will talk a little bit about that. The third thing that we talked about was, <clears throat> how well is this working for entrepreneurs? So if you're doing direct investments in individual companies, are those entrepreneurs getting the kind of capital that they need? Um, and it turns out that when you ask impact investors, are entrepreneurs getting what they need? They basically say, yeah, we think they are. And when you ask entrepreneurs, they have a very different answer. Um, and so we did some research uh, this last year um, here at Duke looking at global health investing, and we released a report a few weeks ago at Oxford. Oxford um, that was looking at some of the experience of entrepreneurs who had received impact investment capital, but asking them, how well did it work for you two years later, three years later, five years later? And we found out that a lot of times it wasn't the right capital for them. So we've been thinking about, you know, what can we do to help entrepreneurs and early stage investors um, you know, make better sense of the kinds of vehicles that are that are out there. There's a tremendous amount of what I would call product innovation at the moment of people trying to say, well, maybe straight equity or, and regular old debt isn't what these companies need, and can we develop new things? Um, and I'm actually really pleased to, to kind of announce to everyone that we're also um, we've, we're we're also in the in the process of developing some online modules for social entrepreneurs and for-profit impact entrepreneurs around getting ready to raise capital and making sure they find the right capital sources, because we think that information um, still needs to be shared more broadly. Um, and we're going to hopefully be piloting some of those more publicly in the fall. Um, so now what I think I'm going to do is turn to some of the questions that were, that were submitted earlier. Um, and as I said, uh, now would be a great time, if you have another question, to tweet it in to the hashtag Fuqua alumni. Um, which is F-U-Q-U-A, alumni, um, and we will we'll take a look at that. So the first question that I want to start with um, is from Samir Bhatti, who is a daytime MBA student from 1998. Um, his question was really about facilitating deal sourcing. He says, How, what kind of success stories or models do you have for facilitating deal sourcing in emerging markets? What would help fund managers build more robust deal flow? Um, and we had another question, actually, from former Case I3 fellow, uh, Greg Payne, who graduated in 13, um, who I know works in Columbia. And he said, across the board, my colleagues in impact investing say the investment pipeline is one of the biggest challenges they face. So the same issue, deal pipeline. How do you identify enough good businesses that also meet their impact criteria? Um, and you know, this is you know, a really important question. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in the space. There's, there's, you know, I've been in rooms where there were investors on one side of the room saying, you know, we just don't have enough deal flow. And then the other side of the room were a whole bunch of entrepreneurs going, we're right here. We, what's the problem? Um, and so what we see in impact investing is that finding a good match between those two can sometimes be more complicated because you're looking at more than one factor. You're not just looking at all the factors that you would look at to see whether something is a good financial investment. You're also trying to fulfill geographic impact vehicle stage. Um, and strategic objectives, and the, the natural intersections are harder. In terms of what I've seen, um, 
I, I have, um, you know, uh, had conversations with investors in developing markets where they are trying to kind of inculcate, um, you know, a set of investment-ready um, enterprises within certain domains. And I've actually talked to some where they, they kind of realized their whole thesis was off, that they thought they could go into a community with a set of capital that was kind of already pre-designed um, to invest a certain way and found that there really wasn't the deal flow there. Um, and some of them have actually changed what they've done. There's actually a foundation in Africa uh, where they had started a fund and then they decided to actually use the foundation grant money instead to create some incubators. So what I would say is the 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 kind of very common solution to that that's come up is people trying to figure out how you incubate and accelerate and provide capacity and development services on the ground for new enterprises. Um, there's a lot of activity in that area going on, especially in India um, and West and East Africa right now. Um, a lot of foundation money has gone into um, supporting those infrastructures, a lot of development finance institution money as well. Um, and we actually uh, are doing something similar. We here at CASE are part of an accelerator that we call SEED, the Social Entrepreneurship Accelerator at Duke, which is working to help global health entrepreneurs um, scale and get ready for investment. And we do that uh, with funding from USAID and East Africa and India. So we're kind of in the weeds on this one. Um, I think in terms of other models that I've seen for deal flow and pipeline, um, there are some interesting things. There's, there's, there's um, um, we just had a, a Case I3 um, student team complete a project for an organization in Ghana that was trying to increase deal flow by education entrepreneurs. Um, and they did a study and they looked at and they said, well, you know, what do, what do, what are challenge funds good at? What about um, kind of peer selection models like village capital? You know, what, are, you know, what, are, what are, where are they useful? They also looked at models like endeavors where you try to um, get a group of, of uh, corporates or investors or other prominent people in the community together to talk about um, what they would want to encourage in their communities and actually start to mentor um, newer entrepreneurs. So there's actually quite a few different models. Um, that someone in a particular community, which is finding that they don't have a lot of deal flow, can, can, can look to. Um, and there's a really good report, actually, on the functioning of those incubators that Andy, the Aspen Network for Developing Entrepreneurs, and Village Capital put out last year, um, which is actually on our Case I3 website. If you Google Case I3 100, we have a list of 100 great readings in impact investing, and it's on that list. Um, we had another set of questions um, from Bill Cleveland, uh, an alum from 1993. Um, he asked a little bit about the differentiation between impact investing and other trends. So um, one of his questions is, you know, how do you know that this is not a fad? Um, how is impact investing for, different from socially responsible investing or triple bottom line investing? Um, and is this kind of the same thing with a new name, which is a great question. Um, the way that I tend to think about it is socially responsible investing, or SRI investing, uh, has been around for the past 30 years. It was born of the idea that people who put their money into public stocks should be able to have a voice about what that stock is doing, and they should be able to pull away from a stock that they don't like. So the idea that grew up in the SRI market was let's screen public stocks and, and remove things that we don't like. So if they're investing in, you know, you name it, um, uh, firearms or non-diverse governance or something else that will pull back. And so there's a whole kind of socially screened marketplace that's it's been around for 30 years. Um, what impact investing kind of started out as was a different impulse, the impulse of not pulling back from the negative, but an impulse of propelling the positive. So, um, you know, the, 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 the impact investing market now, some people view it as just the private market that is, you know, trying to positively impact education or health or uh, agriculture or energy. Um, and some people kind of see the two markets coming together. Um, I wouldn't say that it is um, completely new. I think the practice of impact investing and, and, the, and the, the, you know, the kinds of things that people have been doing, even in, out of foundations, foundations have been doing PRIs, program-related investments, for 
a long time. What's new is kind of putting it under a new umbrella um, and recognizing that there may be standards of practice um, and there may be um, ways of understanding the activity if we put that umbrella over it. So I think, Bill, you're actually right to ask that question. Um, it's not different from triple bottom line. Um, it's 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 uh, you know it's a it's a it's a new useful term uh, for something that's been going on for a while. Um, another question is from Stephanie Larson, um, who is a 13 grad. She asked. How do you see the field of impact investing impacting the traditional corporate structure uh, or world? Um, and that's kind of what I was, I've been, I've been talking about kind of the public and private markets as these two separate things. What we talk about in our book is that we actually see the two affecting each other. So, you know, in our book, we tell the story of um, CalPERS, which is the largest pension fund in the United States. Um, turning to their investment committee and saying, we don't think we're actually looking at all the risks that we should be looking at, and we think it's actually going to harm our investments for these pension holders, um, to whom we are, you know, indebted to provide returns and, and, and look out for their, for their retirement. So they actually change the way that they are thinking about risk and are now incorporating environmental, sustainable, and governance factors into their decision making at the highest levels. Um, th so that kind of attention to maybe there's something that's not on a balance sheet, but that you could see becoming a risk. You know, if you're Exxon and, and you're not managing environmental factors, you know, that can come back and cost you a lot of money. And they're saying we actually need to, to attend to that. At the same time, I think what the impact investing community is offering to the kind of SRI or the social responsible investment community is this, is this laser focused attention on three things. One is focusing on outcomes. What are the social outcomes that you are actually trying to drive? That it's not enough to avoid something bad. What is the thing you're trying to do that's good and can you actually start to account for it? Which is really hard, as we'll talk about, but really important. Second thing is this notion of transparency, that we need to actually talk about the risks that we're seeing. We need to talk about the potential impacts, positive or negative, of something um, and not just pretend it doesn't exist. And the third thing that's coming out of the investment community, impact investment community that I actually think is coming from philanthropy and nonprofits is this notion of constituency, which is to say we, you know, uh, uh, impact investors generally saying we are really not just managing only to our fiduciary responsibility, but we have responsibilities to other constituencies. We have responsibilities to employees. We have responsibilities to the communities in which we work. Um, and this, this notion of kind of unlocking the stronghold on the only the only purpose of a company is to is to make the most money possible at everyone else's expense and to unlock that and say no there's a whole bunch of different constituents and we have to we have to blend those we have to decide where those trade-offs actually are and actually articulate our decisions about them um, which is much harder but is what nonprofits have done and what governments do and so that is kind of seeping into um, you know both the private impact investing market and the larger um, the larger finance market. Um, in fact, my colleague Jed Emerson believes that these trends are the future of capitalism and that um, in fact what we're seeing now is is you know just the the beginnings of a much larger trend. Um, where we are starting to realize that we can't ignore off-balance sheet factors and, 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 and still do well. And what's interesting about that, of course, is a lot of this is kind of um, being built on people's perceptions or their beliefs about what will happen. And what we're starting to see, and it's really small, but we're starting to see it, is the data is starting to come in. So Morgan Stanley, for example, a few weeks ago released a study looking at the performance of um, in investors who are paying attention to sustainability factors and investors who are not, and basically said they're outperforming. Um, and every meta study I've ever seen has said that. And so I think after a while, this data will start to, to speak for itself. And I want to kind of, the other thought I had about that was um, a great quote from one of my colleagues a few weeks ago, Clara Miller, who is the president of the Heron Foundation. And she basically tossed off this line, which everyone laughed at, but I thought it was very profound. She said, you know, every investment is an impact investment. The problem is with most of them, we have no idea what the impact is. And so what she's saying is, this is about your attention. 
right? This is about attending to what are the positive and negative things that are coming out from an investment. I think I want to go to the Twitter feed and look for something, look for, look for a new question here. Um, okay, here's one from Scott Kleiman, um, who is a daytime 2013 MBA. Hi, Scott, who helped us create Case I3. What have you learned about readying nonprofit organizations to pursue impact investment transactions? What are, are the kinds of capacity they need? And what are you seeing about opportunities to develop that capacity? That's a great question. Um, you know, there the there was another question that that I uh, actually had in my in my stack for later that said, you know, do impact investments only go to nonprofits? And of course, they don't. You can put an impact investment in anything. You can, you know, use debt to invest in a nonprofit, and you can use debt and equity and other things to invest in for profits. Um, but in terms of readiness, you know, there's a there's a pretty big leap for many nonprofits. Um, to make a case that something that they are selling is actually investable, right? That they have a regular cash flow and that cash flow can be kind of stable and replicable and that there's a margin from that that they can actually pay someone back with. And so what Scott's referring to is what's the, what's the um, support network like for nonprofits who are trying to do that well? And as Scott knows well, um, there are a lot of organizations, a lot of nonprofit organizations that have started to um, cater to nonprofits doing that. For example, one of them is the Nonprofit Finance Fund, um, uh, who is was run by one of our Case I3 advisory board members, Anthony Buglevine, and they have been extremely active at helping nonprofits parse through um, their financial models and business models and really understand what kind of capital they can take on and then helping them to get it. And there's a whole bunch of other um, intermediaries in the philanthropy and venture philanthropy space who are, have been very good at doing that. I'm imagining that Scott is asking that um, because he's been working in this other area of impact investing called social impact bonds, which is this idea of um, the government um, uh, basically having other people put investments into outcomes that they have been paying for um, and, and allowing people to have a return. But to do that, the person providing the outcomes, which is usually a nonprofit provider, has to actually have the capacity to take on the money. In terms of categories, I would say um, that Scott probably knows better than I do, but I would, I would you know, guess that there are some things there around, you know, what are the, um, you know, what is the unit model that people have in understanding business models? What are the, um, you know, kind of supply uh, constraints for that for that uh, thing, which often for nonprofits is a human resource constraint, and understanding that, um, you know, what are the, um, what are the the kind of economies of scale that may or may not happen as you scale some a nonprofit's impact. So there's a bunch of things there that are tricky and quite appropriate um, for business uh, uh, experts to, to step into. Um, let's see. There's a question from Sean Colt-Farber. What resource can rank best incubator or accelerator in the market space for new entrepreneurs? Oh, it's such a good question. We don't have that data yet. Um, we have a whole bunch of people who have stepped into the marketplace, and we are one of them, um, saying we think that entrepreneurs need help. And let's get on the ground and start trying to see if it's working. And there's been a bunch of, I mentioned the, the Andy study. There's been a bunch of other studies. The Rockefeller Foundation put one out last year uh, with Monitor, kind of saying, what are, what are accelerators learning about what's effective? And um, there's a colleague I have at Emory University, actually. His name is Peter Roberts, who's been doing some data collection from different incubators and accelerators and trying to ask and answer those questions. I think the jury's still out. Um, the, the, I would look at, at Peter's work um, for I think it's kind of the, the highest um, standard in the field right now for starting to be able to rank. But of course, um, you know, there, it, it depends on what questions you're asking about what effectiveness is. Um, and I think that so far, a lot of that effectiveness has been um, looking at whether the entrepreneurs grow um, and, and, and get capital. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, another question from Jim Ackerman uh, from 88. Um, he says, in the coming year, I will be collaborating in an institutional asset management business with a leader in the smart alpha strategy investing field. And he wants to know, 
if I've come across any smart alpha strategies in the impact investing field. Um, I had to look up what a smart alpha strategy is, which I did. <laughs> um, and then I uh, looked around a little bit. Uh, the idea of smart alpha strategy is that you are um, trying to meet investors' risk and return targets based on kind of active rebalancing of the portfolio. And what I liked about this question is um, it allows me to explain kind of what that would depend on, right? So to, to do an active rebalancing, you would need to have pretty good data on returns, pretty good data on risks, and pretty good data on any other factors you might want to balance, in this case, impact, right? So one of the findings of the G8 task force was realizing we're really talking about risk, return, and impact as three main factors that, that people need to balance. In terms of the in impact investing marketplace, I think we are just starting to get to the point where we start starting to understand, especially in private equity. There's two big studies going on right now around returns in private equity. We are almost none of the way in really understanding the risk of different strategies in impact investing across different asset classes, whether they are the same as the asset class that they are mimicking or whether they're different, we don't know yet. And in terms of the impact, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, you know, we're, we're not quite there. So um, what I would say is this probably doesn't exist yet. Um, I could think of two people that I would ask, though, if you're interested. Those would be David Chen at Equilibrium Capital and Audrey Choi at Morgan Stanley. If those, if, if this exists, they would know it. Um, and I'm happy through Twitter or whatever to, to introduce you later. Um, Scott Kleiman has a follow-up. Any surprises from the Case I3 technical assistance work via seed um, with, in terms of organizational readiness? Oh goodness, all sorts of surprises. Um, it's been a really eye-opening process for us. So we at Case have been studying um, social entrepreneurs and how they scale for over a decade. Um, and we study them one by one, we tend to, when we write cases or we do surveys and then we come up with frameworks. And now we have this opportunity to actually get in front of real entrepreneurs and figure out whether our frameworks made sense um, and whether it was really helpful to them. And what we found is, um, in many cases, the frameworks are extremely helpful, that the entrepreneurs are kind of thinking stepwise. What do I need to do tomorrow? What do I need to do next month? And we're kind of saying to them, what's your ultimate end game and what are the paths that you want to get there? And they, they it is been really eye-opening um, for them and, excuse me, for us to see how, how challenging that is um, for them to think that way. And what has been useful is we've been able to say, here are other enterprises that are just like you. And here's where they've made mistakes. And so to, to kind of help these entrepreneurs avoid some of those mistakes. I think the other thing that's been interesting is we're looking specifically at global health enterprises in East Africa and India. Um, they're doing innovative things to Im uh, improve health outcomes for low and middle income people in those countries. Um, and they also, because of that, they have a passion for direct service, right? So many of them are running clinics or running low uh, primary care units or maternity hospitals for the poorest people in those communities and, and you know, trying to figure out how to meet their needs and, and do good, do good health care. Um, what we're finding, though, is that when they're trying to scale, they tend to need to go through intermediaries to scale really efficiently, that to scale direct service is extremely expensive. Um, and so we're finding that they need a whole set of skills that are very different. It's very different to sit and learn how to make a maternity clinic work in a rural neighborhood in Kenya than it is to figure out how to take the model that you developed in that clinic um, and sell it to 10 other existing clinics um, so that they can be more effective in, in reaching their customers' needs, right? Completely different skill sets, um, but often what those what those entrepreneurs have to do. Um, and so there's a there's a there's a kind of um, capacity um, realization uh, effect, I think, that's been happening with some of these entrepreneurs about, you know, I thought I was going to basically build this over and over, and, and, and it turns out that's really not going to be the way I'm going to scale. And so we've been helping them have those conversations. Um, I have two questions about the Etsy IPO from two former students. One is from Maddie Devine from 2014. Hi, Maddie. And one is from Joanne Sprague from 12. Hi, Joanne. Um, and they want to know what is the um, impact of a B corporation like Etsy going public. So the, for those of you who may not be familiar, Etsy um, 
is a company uh, that has that has been a certified B corporation for a number of years. Um, and last week or the week before, um, they IPO'd. Um, they did an initial public offering. I think their stock price doubled on the second or third day. The issue is um, that uh, they're not the first certified B Corporation to go public, um, but they're one of the most prominent. Um, and the, the question has been, you know, can Wall Street basically agree to the terms of the B Corp certification? The terms of the B Corp certification kind of match what I was talking about before, which is, you know, this protection for a company that has intentions around mission. So Etsy, to be certified, uh, is rated on how it treats its employees, on how it treats its suppliers. In Etsy's case, it's actually an agglomeration of individual artisans who sell things. Um, and so, you know, how it treats those, um, you know, quasi-employees, um, how it treats its environment and, you know, and what it does for governance. And those um, protections are, um, you know, something that they take into account and they are basically have been managing that alongside good finance um, and producing a return. And so the question when, when Etsy was going to IPO was, are people going to want to buy that stock? Because there's no guarantee. In fact, there's the opposite um, statement that that company's going to try to maximize shareholder value. The company is not going to try to maximize shareholder value at the expense of some of these other communities. And so it was a really big deal to have this particular company um, um, say that. Of course, it's also run by um, a Duke alum, so we're very proud of Chad uh, uh, to, to, have, to have carried this off. Um, I think the... Um, I'd be interested in, in, you know, what other people watching and Joanne and, and Maddie think. I think it's been a real success. I think it's been a real success for the for the B Corporation movement to have such a prominent IPO. As I said, it's not the first one. There's a Brazilian company that did it a year or two ago. Um, I think it's been really effective for Chad to say we are not changing um, our commitment to these other stakeholders and to our mission, that our mission is built into what makes this company profitable and we are never going to let that go. I think there's also, however, still some questions about um, whether they will, you know, try to remain certified or will actually turn into um, the corporate form that, that, that the B-Lab uh, folks have created. So there's a window, as I understand it, for a company like Etsy, because it depends on which state you're incorporated in. I don't remember which state they're incorporated in, but I talked to, the, the, to my friends at B-Lab about this last week, there's a window in which they have to make a decision. Are they going to, are they, do they want to stay a certified B Corporation? If they do, they actually have to incorporate as a benefit corp. And my understanding right now is that Chad has said that he's not willing to do that, that um, he's getting, um, this is not direct from him at all, but what I've heard is that he's getting information from his stakeholders that says, you know, that's a little bit too far. Why don't you stay what, doing what you're doing and, um, you know, and do all the things that you're doing when you're certified. And so that's going to be an interesting thing to watch to see whether the expectations of the rest of the market can kind of keep up with some of these new legal corporate forms. Um, let me go back to my list. So Allison Finger, who is a 93 grad, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of healthcare outcomes. So she said, how do you evaluate impact for companies involved in global health? Is it only for companies looking to deliver solutions in underserved geographies? Is it diseases that are less financially attractive? Um, you know, what's, how, do you, how does this work? And um, as I said a little bit before, for, for us and in, in the work that we do, and we, we work alongside many other impact investors who are doing the same work, um, the impact for global health companies um, uh, is based on, um, you know, targeting a certain population for a certain kind of health outcome and then trying to manage to that. In our case, our money is coming from USAID, which is coming from Congress that has certain definitions attached to it. So we are looking in certain countries at certain kinds of interventions um, for certain populations and other popula you know, other pop programs might have, um, might have uh, different, um, you know, different constraints. Um, we see that am among impact investors as well. There are some impact investors in the market like Acumen who are looking specifically at people with a certain income level. There are other impact investors um, who consider impact to be, you know, any sort of good health outcome in an area that is generally underserved, right? So it really varies according to the, the intention 
of the entrepreneur uh, and the investor. Um, which kind of leads me to the next question. So there was a series of questions that I mentioned before. There were a series of questions about the idea of measuring social impact and how it's done. So I have one from Paula Caroga, who is a cross-continent 11, um, who says, what are the main indicators for measuring social impact from an impact investing perspective? Um, how is it compared, she asks, or analyzed among different funds, which is a great question. I don't, she says she finds it hard to imagine comparing the impact of a vaccine um, to an education program um, and kind of saying, how do you even look at social return across these different things? Um, and there were several others. I think if I can pull up some of these other questions. But there were at, at least two others who kind of said this idea of impact measurement really interested us um, and we want to know more. So this is a huge topic. Um, I've probably been working on this for over two decades. So let me just see what I can do in about five minutes to, to cover some of this. The short answer is, you know, the first thing that you need to kind of differentiate in your mind is what we call um, outputs versus outcomes. So it's very easy for an entrepreneur to count the activity, the, the kind of the kinds and type and amount of activity that they're providing. So how many vaccines did you deliver? How many women gave birth in your hospital? Um, you know, the, 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 the kind of counting of, of your activity, every entrepreneur, you know, tends to do as part of their business. And sometimes that's enough. Sometimes somebody's selling eyeglasses and you say, you know, the fact that that person bought those eyeglasses and put them on the face, that's kind of good enough for me. I'm going to believe that they're going to be more effective because they can see. Then there are other kinds of impacts where you actually don't want to stop at just outputs. You want to actually get to outcomes, which is kind of the desired change that you're trying to get to. So an example of an outcome would be lower infant mortality or um, higher educational achievement for kids, or um, more smallholder farmers who can um, exist independently because their income is high enough. Generally, those sorts of outcomes are costlier to determine. It usually is something, not always, but it can usually be something that's kind of outside of the regular everyday activity of the business. And it turns out that nonprofits are usually paid extra to figure out whether a real outcome is happening, right? So there's all of these practices in the nonprofit sector from, you know, pre and post surveys all the way up to really heartily designed third party random control trials where you set up a control group and you set up a treatment group and you study them and you say, there's a statistical difference here, so we know this program works. Most entrepreneurial ventures do not have the time and money to do that. So what the field of impact investing has been struggling with is what do you do instead? What's feasible to figure out the impact of an intervention? Um, you know, every entrepreneurial um, innovation is, is, you know, kind of placing a bet on some kind of intervention. How do you know when that's working? And how, what's the level of proof that's desired by different stakeholders? And this is where it gets interesting, because it turns out that government stakeholders need a much higher level of proof, especially as they invest a lot of dollars in something, because they have to justify why they're using public money to do something. And if it's not having that impact, they should probably put it somewhere else. Private investors, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. It, it, it does it match their intent. So you know, part of what we tell when we're, we're looking at this from the entrepreneur point of view is we say, you know, really pay attention to your stakeholders and what is the level of um, certainty that they need about your impact. Then, of course, we get to the level that um, Paula was asking about, which is, well, what if you're looking across at a whole bunch of different things? You're looking at an energy intervention and a vaccine and a um, maternity clinic and an education program. How, do you, how can you possibly <laughs> make a judgment about the relative impact of these things? So a bunch of us have been facing this, as I said, for a number of years, and there's kind of been two waves of solution. One wave is to try to turn that impact into dollars because dollars can be compared. So my colleague, Jed Emerson, who I mentioned before, created this thing called social return on investment. So you basically take an ROI calculation, but you make it around the output. So you, 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 you count things, you come up with a dollar value for those things, and you calculate a social return. You can even use a spreadsheet, you can project it out, and you can say a dollar that we spend today will save us $17 in the future. The government does this. The government does cost-benefit analysis, which is what this basically is, for all of its large programs. Welfare to work, you get someone to study it, you figure out the cost benefit, they don't, they don't put $40 billion into something unless there's a really strong cost benefit. Um, the, the 
trick with that is it's all in the assumptions. It's all in the assumptions that you use for what for what that thing is worth. Um, and very few impact investors today, there's a few, but very few impact investors today are requiring people to do that kind of monetization, quantification exercise because they're not sure that they believe the numbers and they're not sure that um, it justifies. There are, there are pockets where people are doing that. So we were talking about social impact bonds a little bit a while ago um, in terms of what Scott and others have been doing. The government is monetizing those benefits very carefully to see whether there is actually a return that can be shared with outside investors. And so those tools have, have migrated into that form. The second wave, I said there were two. One is social return on investment. The second wave has been to say, let's look at the company holistically. And let's actually look, see if we can create a framework where we can get a sense of the relative um, impact of different parts of that company. And that's actually what, that's kind of the genesis of the B Corporation certification. So before that certification, there were things where you could look at specific interventions. You could say, well, is this building LEED certified? Well, what is LEED certification about? It's about um, what are your, what things have you built into this building that, that, that align with sustainability? But it doesn't say anything about the company that did the building. It's just it's 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 looking at the product, right? It's certifying the product, um, a fair trade label, certifying the product, um, a UL listing on an electricity, an electric gadget is certifying the project. What B said is let's actually certify the company that's making the product, and let's look across that whole company. Let's look at their governance. Um, do they have an outside board of directors? Let's look at how they treat employees. Do they have good benefits? Do they have living wages? Do they um, uh, give people time off to do things in the community? Let's look at what kind of philanthropic contributions they have, and let's look at their impact. So this idea of could you look across a whole company, and when you do that, all of a sudden you have the opportunity to ask questions about almost every kind of impact that people have in mind. Um, from do you employ hard to employ workers, which is the community development field, all the way to did you reduce your carbon footprint um, in manufacturing. And so what the B certification, and there's a few others around the world that have developed to try to do this, have done is basically put everybody into a corporate box and said, let us understand and basically give you a score for your impact overall as a company. So you can go online if you look at bcorporation.net and you look up B corporations, all of the certified B corporations have their scores online where you can say this company is getting most of its points from being good at addressing um, low-income people's needs. This company, however, doesn't do that at all. This company is getting most of its points because it's putting solar panels on people's houses and it's saving a lot of uh, uh, energy. And so, you know, you still have the apples and oranges comparison, but it's in a framework where you can say this one is five star and this one is two star and here's why. Um, and the belief that um, they had when they put this together, which I still believe is important, is that you can't start to really scale the impact investing field until you have some sort of one or more standard measures that people can start to put into that risk return and impact framework. Um, so over time, um, what we are hoping that we can start to see is patterns where certain kinds of impactful companies align with certain kinds of risks and returns, and then it will become much easier for people to assemble kind of balanced portfolios that, that match their objectives. That was kind of a mouthful. I hope that made sense. So we have a question from Manisha, who's a daytime 15. Hello, Manisha. How will tri-sector leadership training prepare impact investors for taking on global health beyond clinics and insurance? That's a great question. So um, tri-sector leadership, as I talked about a little bit in the in the pre-reading video, is this notion that's come out of some of our research and some of others that to really succeed as a social entrepreneur, as an impact investor, um, you need to have skills from different sectors. So you, there, there, there are some very specific skills around understanding kind of the, the, the key um, techniques and vocabulary frameworks um, and lessons from the nonprofit world. There's really important things to understand in policy if you're going to scale impact, and there's obviously very important things from finance and business. So we've been talking about this, this, this need to train new leaders for the impact economy writ large in these tri-sector leadership skills. And 
Manish has been around campus as we've been trying to develop this. We've done a bunch of things this year that we're really excited about. We launched um, this effort in tri-sector leadership in September at the SOCAP conference and had people do a quiz to um, uh, judge their own readiness uh, across these different sectors. And then we had a workshop where they went to the, they, they did an exercise in the area that they were weakest in and then we compared. We also had, um, some workshops this year um, here at Fuqua around this issue, and we're building these into our courses, right? They're already there, but it helped us to realize we have to be really articulate about this and we have to be more intentional because this is the place where social entrepreneurs often run into obstacles. And as Manisha states, in global health, it's really important. There is, it's very difficult for any new global health innovation um, to scale without bumping into policy issues, um, especially in developing countries. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the I'm, I'm thinking of a very concrete example, I can actually think of like three or four at the moment, um, even within our own portfolio, where the, um, you know, the, the decision of where the government service um, <coughs> obligation ends is a really interesting one, right? If you see something in a community that's not being delivered to a, to a group of people and you know that they deserve this service, do you, do you deliver it instead of the government forever? Or do you try to engage the government in learning how to deliver that service effectively, right? And there's no right answer. Um, but it's a really important question for a social entrepreneur and for an impact investor. What are you trying to end with? Are you trying to end by changing the system that's there? Are you trying to end by plugging the system that's there? And if you do that, are you going to be able to do it independently? Or are you going to need a subsidy going forward for a very long time? And so that's the game that a lot of these social entrepreneurs and global health impact investors are playing is where are the models that actually could be sustainable and growing without ongoing subsidy at some point? Um, and are those investable models? Or are we talking about you know, trying to grow something that maybe can half sustain itself or a three quarters sustain itself but still need subsidy from a government or a development agency or, or someone else? Um, and it's not until you start to do it that you see whether that's possible. The other thing that we're seeing um, in there, Manisha, is that the um, the expectations that the entrepreneurs have about what works in a small way often don't match when they start to scale up, that they discover all sorts of obstacles. Um, just a small example is you know, what I would call kind of supply chain, but in many of these health, uh, health innovations, the supply chain is it's either technology, if it's, a, if it's a technical solution, or it's people, if it's a clinic, that they just can't train enough people fast enough um, to replicate their clinics. So, you know, then you get into this, well, how do you solve that? Well, then you have to start thinking about how you're actually educating nurses um, throughout Kenya, which is not usually something that the entrepreneur is, is well-versed in thinking about, so they have to start partnering with other people, and then that tri-sector leadership thing kicks in. All righty. Mark Albion. Hi, Mark. I had a good question. What are specific issues that large business families face when considering impact investing individually as a family or for a multi-billion family business? That is a great question, and I wish Jed was here to answer it. Um, my colleague Jed has um, basically um, turned himself into a consultant uh, to families who are interested in taking their whole portfolio <coughs> and turning it towards impact investing, both their public market and their private market holdings. Um, I think there's a bunch of different issues. I think that there's some really good reports that have been written on this. Um, there's uh, one that was written by um, the World Economic Forum um, a few months ago um, that was just actually re-released yesterday as part of the Impact Capital Summit's primer on impact investing, which I tweeted, so it's in my Twitter feed, um, where, and there's a few others that are listed in the Case I3100 list. Um, on the caseI3.org website, but the you know the issue is how does a family come to terms with what their objectives are, um, and a family you know can be very coherent about that or can be you know very spread out about that depending on the family, and then what are their beliefs about um, you know whether they are willing to to kind of move to that slowly or move to that quickly, and are there any trade offs for them in terms of the the risk um, that they might want to take. Um, which is <clears throat> probably things that Mark already knows, but I appreciate him asking the question because there's obviously a lot of new wealth or family offices uh, who are really interested 
in impact investing and looking at their whole portfolio or pieces of their portfolio and saying, how do we start to align these investments with our values? And they often have much more flexibility um, than other institutions do. And so they're kind of leading the field. So there's, you know, there's, there's groups like KL Felicitas, uh, which, which, who have been working with an advisor, Sonin Capital, to slowly move their portfolio to 100% impact. There's the RS, RS Group in Hong Kong. Um, uh, there's a family in Denver doing the same thing. There's, a, there's, a, you know, there's more and more um, of these groups um, coming together and saying, if we're going to do this, let's, 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 you know, let's do it um, seriously. Um, John, I don't have a last name, MBA 89. He's a nonprofit finance leader who's done a lot of work with CDFI funds and points out that they have uniform impact measurements, um, but they're also what he calls a single closed loop funding entity <coughs> where financial return expectations are uniform and easily understood. He says, do you think the players will coalesce around uniform measurement paradigms that will force the nonprofit sector to improve their data reporting capabilities? Wouldn't this unlock much more capital for the benefit of the organizations doing the work? Um, I, 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 I think it would be great if that would happen. I am not um, convinced that we're even close to that happening, and I'm not convinced that it's ever going to happen on the nonprofit side. I think the um, motivations and constraints of the for-profit sector are, are causing the, the for-profit enterprise and investment sector to be much more creative um, in terms of thinking about how you look across different kinds of investments and create standard measures. I think the nonprofit sector um, enjoys and should enjoy the flexibility to go deep um, and to custom design um, you know, really interesting ways of understanding how impact is happening wherever that might be. Um, and I actually, there's a piece of me that wants to protect that and kind of doesn't want to um, dummy that down to the, the common denominator that might be necessary for a standard. Um, I often say to people, uh, entrepreneurs especially, who are kind of coming and saying, how much impact measurement you know, should I do? And how do I navigate this? And, you know, how fast should I grow based on what I know is I kind of say, well, there's the rowboat analogy and the speedboat analogy. The rowboat analogy is you're still kind of paddling through tributaries and you're learning things as you paddle and you may be changing your model along the way. And usually the nonprofit forum gives you huge flexibility to do that because you can learn new things, you can get new money for it, you can go in different directions, you can open programs, you can close programs, you can do a lot of things. Yes, there's all this um, brouhaha over restricted capital, but you still have a lot of flexibility. The for-profit model is kind of like you're a speedboat or you're done, is I'm going to give you capital and you're going to speed through to get to the margin and return that I need for that capital or else you're kind of going to go out of business. And so what I tell people is you really want to wait until you have a model that you're very confident in before you actually get impact investing capital because it's not R&D capital most of the time. Grants are R&D capital. Um, Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, was just at the Council on Foundations yesterday apparently saying, foundations are the R&D capital arm of the world, and I agree with that. Um, in fact, investing is really not about that. It's, it's about getting there um, with some certainty. Um, and so I, would, I, 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 I totally believe in standards, but I'm not sure I believe in them um, equally for both sectors. Where are we? Let's see. Asa Minoz asks, what are some of the most interesting trends in terms of national policy in different places promoting the development of impact investing? Um, so that's an interesting question because there was all this activity, as I mentioned last year, around this G8 commission that was formed to look at social impact investing across the G8 countries. And there's a whole series of reports that were put out um, by the different G8 countries and then across them. Um, and what and those are all on the case I3. 100 site again. Those reports are linked there. Um, what's interesting about that is realizing through that process, and I was part of the U.S. National Advisory Board, so I was part of the American group trying to decide what our policy should be, but then also having conversations with the larger international group. And we all met in London last summer 
and every country presented where they were in terms of what their policies did now and where they wanted to go. What was fascinating about that, and it's somewhat predictable, but it was fascinating to see it viscerally and in real life, was that many of the European countries really felt that there should be a restriction on profits really felt that for you to invest in a for-profit company that had some sort of mission attached to it, you needed to protect the idea that private investors or private individuals would walk off with the profits from that. And so they were talking caps. They were saying, yes, we can create this corporate form, but it has to have a cap. It has to basically kind of resemble a nonprofit where you know profits can't be, be pulled out. And of course, the American and British part of the contingent um, was really not excited about that at all. Um, that's not how our markets work. That's not the engine of, of entrepreneurship here. And it's not our kind of belief structure about you know, how people are rewarded. Um, so there were a lot of conversations you know, between France, Germany, Italy, Japan, um, who are kind of in that camp, and then Australia, Canada, the US, and the UK were saying, let's let a thousand flowers bloom. Let's make sure we have some corporate forms like the KIC, the Community Investment Corporation, I think it's called in the UK, um, or the LC3, the Limited Liability Corporation in the US, which actually do protect profits from being redistributed. But let's not only do that. Let's also have forms like Benefit Corps and, and regular certified LLCs and, and C Corps where people can have profits and also do their mission. And we hope that um, you know both will both will succeed. In terms of other policies, um, you know, there's a whole range of them. The the one thing I will point out is that the rest of the world admires what the U.S. has done over the past 30 years in terms of our community development policy. So we have a, um, a, a part of the government called the CDFI, the Community Development Financial Institution uh, uh, regulation. We have a um, we have a, a, a set of guidelines about what it means to invest in low-income communities. We have carrots and sticks for banks to do that investing. And as a result, there's been more than $80 billion um, invested in low-income communities and jobs in the U.S. over the past 30 years. Um, it is... Um, a, you know, it is something that, that, that those other countries really would like to emulate. Um, it's, it's funny here because that, that particular regulation is kind of constantly under scrutiny and always being threatened to being take away, taken away. But if, in fact, you know, one of the things we learned from our, from our study of our book is that, that those community development funds have actually spurred this in industry in the U.S., that, that nearly every fund that we studied that had a long-term track record had some government designated dollars in it that had at some point come from a bank that was trying to fulfill its Community Development Act obligations. So the government is an important stimulator of impact investing. Um, I think that may be it. So what I'm going to do now is um, get to my last notes here. Um, is thank everybody for joining us. It's been a great conversation. I hope it was useful to you guys. We had about 172 people pre-registered and we've had a lot of questions come in. We're gonna do the random drawing for the audiobook copy of my prop, The Impact Investor book. So we're pleased to, we'll be tweeting out the winners for that under the Fuqua alumni hashtag um, later. Um, and uh, if there are any other questions that you have, please feel free to, to drop me a note. I'm uh, kathy.clark at duke.edu. Um, and our next faculty presenter at FUCO will be Jonathan Cummings, and we will be sending more information about that talk in June from the alumni office. So thank you.